Chase, a strapping six foot two Iraq war veteran, is a devoted husband and father of two beautiful girls. After a year overseas, 26 year old Chase returned home to the small southern town of Kennesaw, Georgia, about 20 miles north of Atlanta. But tormented by his own demons, his wife Amanda says Chase struggled with bipolar disorder. We've had some hard times with his mental stability. And the last time Amanda saw Chase alive, unfortunately, they were arguing in the car. He wants to walk away, but obviously I'm not going to let him just walk away. To cool things down, she dropped Chase off in the parking lot of the convenience store where he worked the night shift. He's threatening to jump out of the car and punching the dash. Amanda hoped to see him after work, but instead, our Atlanta affiliate CBS 46 reports Chase spent the night at his friend Brad Clement's house. It wasn't especially strange until 24 hours pass and nobody hears from Chase. His mom, Stephanie Cadena, calls his cell, hoping he'll pick up. Hi, baby, will you please give me a call? I'm assuming that you're just sleeping, which is totally okay, but I need to know that you're all right. I love you. A mother's love is not enough to get a return call. And as the hours tick by, worry turns to sheer panic. Nothing would make me happier than for him to walk through the front door. Stephanie calls the Cobb County Police Department, but cops say since Chase has left on his own accord, there's no reason to suspect foul play. They agree to take a brief walk through Brad's home. Nothing seems suspicious. With growing frustration and little help from the police, Chase's mother and Amanda deploy troops of their own, launching a feverish search with more than 100 volunteers. This isn't him. This, he would never do this, and you know, he wouldn't just go and leave his family and his loved ones here. They blanket the town with flyers, hold vigils, and set up a Facebook group called Team Chase with updates on their search. We want him to know that we just love him, and that's all. That's just the only feelings that we have right now. Six excruciating months have passed, but no trace of Chase is found. We have absolutely no answers at all. But at least the right questions will soon be asked. Now realizing Master didn't disappear willingly, cops officially open an investigation and turn their sights on Chase's buddy Brad, the last known person to see Chase alive. He declines taking a polygraph, saying his emotions are all over the place, but agrees to speak with police. It would only be another frustrating dead end. The interviews yield no clues, and cops don't name Brad a suspect. And despite claiming his innocence, Brad says he received a barrage of nasty comments on social media. To lift the veil of suspicion, he agreed to speak on camera. The whole reason I got into this was to help the guy. Brad reasoned that if he was guilty in any way, why would he stay in town? I've been here in Atlanta. Like, I haven't tried to disappear. But there was still the burning question that Chase's family needed answered. Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of Chase Master? No, I did not. I had nothing to do with him just completely disappearing off the face of this earth. Clement says the night Chase slept over, they stayed up all night talking about his marital problems. I was in no way part of anything other than just trying to help him work something out with his wife. The next morning, Brad says he ran errands while Chase slept. When he returned, his friend was gone. That's when he also called Chase's cell. Hey, man. What's up? Where'd you go, dude? I just got back from uh, having to run downtown. The roofing guy said uh, he left, uh, like, two hours ago or something, I think. They just left out of here, but all right, man. Well, you know, what's Here's what Brad said about that message, making a reference to workers at the house. I asked the roofer guys if they'd seen him, and uh, they were just like, who? But something felt off about Brad's story, and it was about to become just that, a story. The roofing contractor said none of his crew ever laid eyes on Chase. Nobody who was working for me or that was with me ever saw him. Here's what Brad had to say after being called out on that discrepancy. I mean, I just assumed they saw him leave. Like, I don't see how they wouldn't have. Chase's mom became convinced Brad Clement killed her son. She even theorized he disposed of Chase's body in a dumpster. Brad says it would have been physically impossible since at 6'2", Chase was such a big guy. For me to just try to like roll, you know, roll Chase around 
and throw them in a dumpster like in my front yard. Like, I don't even think I could do it, like, you know, without the help of somebody else. And there was no evidence that dumpster was emptied into a landfill before anyone thought to search it. I don't think that he's alive. Because? Because I don't think that he would stay away from us. Days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months. The missing case of Chase Masner goes ice cold. Living the last three years with the not knowing and without him here is pure hell. But then Chase's story captures the attention of the media and sparks the interest of Nancy Grace. First of all, he is a war vet. My father was in the military. Catapulting the case into the national spotlight. Something about it strikes a chord in me, and I want to work on it. Next, could media heat be enough to thaw this ice cold case? And then at a certain point, it becomes like a Rubik's Cube that you just can't make it work. And a dramatic face to face meeting is arranged between Chase's mom and Brad Clement. But will he actually show up? And it's not long before the cold case unit gets a game changing tip, pointing in the direction of Brad Clement's former house, where Master was last seen alive. 